So welcome everyone. We're at the Cedarburg Art Museum today on a beautiful summer day in 2020. Um, this panel discussion is related to the exhibition, uh, Eye of the Beholder, African Americans Collect Collecting Art. And this has been curated by Evelyn Patricia Terry. Um, I do curating at the Cedarburg Art Museum when we don't have the luxury of of guest curators like Evelyn. So I've enjoyed working with Evelyn during this show. And we're also thankful to Blaine Gibson, who is not only a collector, but our board president at the Cedarburg Art Museum, and actually the originator of the idea for this exhibition. We also have a catalog that's related to this show and that's available in our gift shop for $16. And it covers all 23 collectors, uh, 68 artworks um, are included in a checklist. And um, we have uh, Evelyn's biographical information about each of the 23 collectors. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Evelyn, who can start with some of our questions. All right. Um, thank you, Mary, for that. I've enjoyed working with the museum. It's been a, a great experience to even go into the homes of all the collectors that I was able to uh, meet with. I didn't get to meet with everybody, but I was able to look at the images from uh, everybody and decide how to select to select pieces and and basically what i wanted to do was to try to get enough people in that either had a range of covering periods like some artists may be represented more than once because they've been probably out longer or collected longer than other people and i was also looking for a variety of styles so all these people exemplified all of those criteria. I was looking for uh, especially people, of course, with mature styles. And when I say mature styles, it's that they have a style that is distinctively different than somebody else's style. So that's what I'm looking at. And, and then picking a different range of people. I'm excited about all these people that have come forth or that I discovered or other people helped help me to discover. Um, so we had 23 collectors and we have a few with us today. Some of them are not able to, they said they were participating but the last minute they had to drop out because of commitments and commitments to other things. So I'm happy to have you with us and I'm one of the collectors too. I, I may not talk about it because I like to talk a lot. It doesn't sound like it, but I do. <laughs> so I'll start with the first question, which is you can talk about how, when, or where, any of that, how did you get started? And maybe we can start with Blaine <laughs> because you're first on my list. Now this is not Blaine's piece. No, no, not not my piece. But uh, as far as collecting, um, um, I actually went to school for art, have an art major. Uh, so someone actually uh, bought a piece that I had done uh, to add to their collection, which started me thinking about it um, at an early age. I was probably about 21, 22 at the time. Um, However, and this, this is one of the pieces, one of, one of our pieces, um, it was probably about two years ago that I actually made the conscious decision that I wanted to start collecting and, and adding to, uh, adding to uh, um, our, our, our collection. And this is actually the very first piece that I uh, purchased for that collection. So, um, a long way to say about two years ago. <laughs> Right, and you were traveling, right? Correct, correct. Uh, my wife and I were. Where you went? 
and how you got that piece and what you felt. Yeah, well, my wife and I were in, in Guatemala uh, at uh, Lake Atitlan, um, and this was uh, San, San Juan La Laguna, uh, which is a small um, town on the lake, uh, lake surrounded by 13 towns, and, and this uh, San, San Juan was the, uh, one of the larger of the towns. Uh, so we were there and, and met an artist, uh, went into his studio, and uh, he had several paintings that he had done. And uh, one of them I know was, I thought was a better quality painting. Um, and uh, it was at a lower price than the one we just saw that we ended up buying. And I asked him why that was at a higher price uh, when I thought the other one was a better quality. And he said, well, the one, the one with the uh, lower price is something that everybody around the lake does. All the artists around the lake do work like that. He said, but this one, he said, is a journey. It's a story of the journey uh, of his people to uh, a town, Chichi Castanengo, which is the, uh, like their, their market. It's, it's almost like a holy journey. And I said, well, if you tell me about the journey, I'll buy that painting. Um, and he did. And so I bought the painting and I said, you know, rest assured, I, I'll take good care of it. Uh, it'll be displayed prominently, you know, in our home, things like that. Um, and then he broke down and cried uh, and, and gave, me, gave me a big hug. And so it was, it was an interesting story. Um, and he, he's, he's probably about five, four. So he came up to about here on me <laughs> and giving me a hug was, was something that was, uh, uh, Pretty interesting, but um, a, a good story with, with that painting. Great. Do you have anything else you want to say about collecting? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things was if I were to give advice to people that, that are collecting, um, you know, uh, first of all, I would collect things that speak to you or move you. Um, and also, uh, from my financial background on the other side of it, uh, you know, how do you position something like this for the next generation and, and so on and so forth is that, you know, understand if this is something you want to leave to your kids and family, make sure it's something that they, they would like also, uh, or if not, you know, something you might plan on making other, um, arrangements for like do donating to a museum or charity or something like that. Uh, but starting a collection, it's got to be something that moves you or speaks to you. Um, and I, I would say that, that if you start with that, you, you, you won't go wrong. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to June Perry Stevens. Hi, June. Hi. <laughs> um, I guess because I grew up um, with art, my mother was a docent at the museum in where I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and I had to go with her every Saturday when she gave tours. So um, I remember clearly um, her pointing out Ramar Bearden, and um, so I knew about art and the quality of art and artists who uh, were prominent during that time. So over the years, um, when I um, established my home, I started buying um, Charles Bibbs. Um, Geekle, is that what it's called? Geekle. Geekle. I started buying Charles Bibbs because I had this big house with big walls and his paintings were big. And I remember going to the studio up on Burleigh in Anwar had these charcoals there, um, a boy and a girl, and I didn't know which one I wanted. So I bought one and took it home. I bought the boy and I really wasn't feeling it. And I went back to him and said, I, you know, I want to, I think I want the other one. And he was so amenable to that, that that was really the first um, piece that I bought that was an original by a Milwaukee artist. Um, mm -hmm. So just being able to communicate with the artist, being able to try it out, saying I didn't like it, take it back and get the other one, which I did like, and which was one of my 
first pieces beyond the Charles Bibbs that um, I started, where I started collecting. And I think I tell you, Elvin, I really didn't see myself as a collector. Um, I just saw myself as buying stuff that I liked and putting it where I could see it. And I love to have things around me that I can see, feel and touch. So my collecting, um, I don't know. <laughs> when it started. Well, you do have a collection, so you are yeah, a collector. Yes, I do. Um, and, you know, I live in a smaller place in a condo now, and I've had to, I can't display everything, so I rotate it out. Um, mm. I have a storage area where I keep some things in. Um, I may put something out, leave it for a year or so, and then change it up, move stuff around. So I'm glad to be able to have a collection that I can do with. And um, who knows, I may buy something. I bought the um, Romano a couple of years ago up at West Bend when I saw his exhibit up at the museum. Mm -hmm. And then I bought Sharon's piece. I love that. Yeah, I bought that Good just about... Uh, um, maybe a year and a half ago. So I guess I continue to collect um, with things that just, I, I just really like the beauty of them. And with that piece, I remember visiting his studio outside of Madison. Yeah, I was sorry I couldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. I was out of town. And he's one of the newest people, uh, self-taught artists who um, have come into prominence recently in this area. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't able to I was, I was not expecting anyone to have his work. So I'm glad yeah. you were able to contribute that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the next person is Yuna Sandoval. Well, great, I finally got to a room that doesn't have the lawnmower. Oh, okay, great. Where are you now? <laughs> Are you in Milwaukee? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be back soon, though. <laughs> okay. I did drop a book off for you. Okay. There, you know, Dot's taking care of everything over there, so we're good. Right. Okay. Okay, ask me the question. Uh, the question is, how, when, and where did you start collecting art? You know, Again, much like June, I don't see myself as a collector. I was just trying to make my house feel like a home. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to, you know, get this old Victorian that needed everything. And I started meeting artists like Evelyn, who literally picked me up off the street and helped me out and, and introduced me to a wealth of artists. So one of the things that I do now, whenever I'm in a town, I look for that artist colony because all of them have it. Um, and then I got to meet all these guys. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. All kinds of guys. <laughs> all these guys and girls that were just amazing. And so I started making sure um, I'm a I'm an old government worker and a community development person, and I don't think there's any better way for African Americans to spend money on art than with other African American artists because art is one of our economic engines, whether we want to admit it or not. And so I made sure that I started going around and meeting artists and talking to artists and finding ways to support their work. And when I'm whenever I'm working on a 501 event, I'm always asking an artist to donate something so people will buy things from them. So mm -hmm. I'm lucky because I got a chance to buy all this great art and and a lot of times um, I was able to get with them and talk about who I was and who they were. And we would find a piece of art that the artist and I would agree on that belonged to me. <laughs> so I'm really, really glad to have been able to do that. And now I find myself doing it. Um, jewelers with jewelers and even obviously with textiles and clothing because it's all art. Um, mm -hmm. Not just what goes on your wall, but even now with culinary people that I make sure it's all art. So it's, it broadened my horizon. It taught me um, to appreciate the quality of life. It's not how much money you have, it's how you live. So that mm -hmm. was why, that's how I got into it. Great. Well, um, I think from your bio, you had a uh, relative too that maybe influenced you somewhat. I did. My aunt is a visual art. Well, she was, she's passed on, but she also worked with uh, Charles Bibbs and I think, what's his name? White, Evelyn, I can't remember his name. Charles White. 
Charles White, and she co-painted with him for years. So I've got mm -hmm. his work in LA and her work in LA. And so I'm trying to be, you know, wherever things are, I'm trying to match up with those artists. And I just love the idea that that has happened. And again, I learned from her that art is an expression of your personality. Right, and I'll ask you maybe who was the first, can you remember the first uh, piece that you bought when you came to Milwaukee? Because I know you started collecting earlier, right? Yeah, but the first piece in Milwaukee, I think it was Gerald. Mm -hmm. well, you know, it may not have been Gerald. But I it ever, could have been because he lived around the corner from you. Right, but it may have been you because Gerald didn't have anything. Oh. And I think he referred me to you. Okay. And I came over to, I think it was Lincoln or you yep, had stuff had a at studio. Miller. Remember you had stuff at Miller? I don't know. It, it right. all is kind of a blur, but mm -hmm. boy, has my life been enriched. And I just want to say to the Cedarburg Museum and to Evelyn, thanks for including me because, okay. you know, it's like yeah, a tree yeah. falling in the forest. You don't become a collector, June, until someone looks at your collection. Yeah. <laughs> I own that and I'm very honored and very happy that people are recognizing the art that we have. And I'm gonna say this for Della, because she's not on the call, but we need to protect our economic investment in our black art and make sure that our artists are getting their due. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just say that. And I, I, Evelyn, it probably was you, probably. actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, it was so long ago. <laughs> so maybe hey, in the 19th I'm not that old. What, what, what? You're not that, you're, you're spring. <laughs> also, I will say, I don't know if it's up here, but there's also a piece in there from my daughter who, right. you know, grew up doing this. Evelyn took it. Um, she recreated Sunday in the Park with Maury Blackface or something, but she did this as a, I think, undergraduate project at Syracuse. So I'm proud of that, proud of that one too. Got to make your own art or something. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah. Right, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. The next person is supposed to be me, but I'll go to De uh, Wayman because Della is an on. Della did text me because I text her and she said she forgot. <laughs> so I'll see, I told her she could come in. And Cynthia, I know, said she was coming in, but I don't know if she can get in so easily. So Wayman, let's go with you. Okay, hey, what's your question? Oh, okay. The question is, how, where, and when did you start collecting? Um, I know you have a beautiful story about, you know, when you thought about it seriously, but I know you, in your statements, that you started a little bit before that, but maybe you could tell both of them. Yeah, I... Um was trained as an architect in the School of Art and Architecture. And so, um, and I thought I was gonna be an artist until I, mm -hmm. as a teenager, discovered this thing called architecture, which is art and science that are married together. And being at the university, I was always surrounded by young artists and um, art that sometimes was absolutely repulsive then and, and would just elicit these different responses from me. But the most important thing of seeing art early was that I never thought of myself as a collector or that I could own it. I thought it'd be something I could make. And I knew artists. Um, I um, uh, knew artists out of the Chicago community, but I never saw myself as a collector until um, 2001, uh, I was uh, living in Portland, Oregon, and Bank of America had acquired a collection called the uh, Hewitt Collection. And uh, John and Vivian Hewitt had started collecting back in the Great Depression um, and had collected one of the largest complete collection of art and African-American art in the country. And I remember going to the show, it was just a phenomenal show. And it, it really covered everyone from Henry O. Tanner uh, through 
Romare Bearden, uh, Hale Woodruff. I mean, it just had all of the legends of, uh, let's say, the first hundred years of modern African American art. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Hewitt sold her collection to Bank of America for $39 million. Wow. Uh, but here's what's important. She could have gotten three to four times that. But a condition of the sale was that the collection had to stay together. And I remember when she presented, she talked about her collection being her baby. And by the way, the uh, Hewitt collection is now a major part of the Harvey B. Gantt Center for African American Art in the Carolinas. Um, and she talked about her art being her babies. And I just remember a, a photograph of her and her husband in the apartment in New York. And there was virtually not one spot on the wall you could put art. I mean, they had art from the ceiling all the way down. It looked like one of those Baroque <laughs> uh, uh, palaces with so much art on the wall. But this is what Mrs. Hewitt taught me because I told her how much I loved art. Uh, but I never saw myself as a collector. And she just said, young man, she said, it's really simple. Buy what you love. Mm -hmm. You never go wrong. Yeah. And, um, and I followed that. And um, the first piece I bought um, was a piece by uh, Bella called Mrs. Walker. And one of the things I noticed when I looked at my collection, partly triggered by Blaine, you and your work of bringing Black collectors together. And I, like, you know, I just want to say, I think it is absolutely extraordinary. And I just want us all to think about this issue about African-Americans' role in the society, because Blaine was part of the Cedarburg and had this idea connected with another artist. We are all together. And uh, Blaine, when you had us, um, uh, the reception for the collectors, um, Many of us know each other. <laughs> Our paths are crossed. Uh, we work together. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and of course, for me, when I looked at the work of uh, June and Una and the others, I loved everybody else's work. <laughs> right, right. And so um, Mrs. Hewitt was the person that opened up my eyes. And so my first piece was Mrs. Walker. And I've been, I had subconsciously had been collecting art that was, uh, mainly black women or what you might call Madonna and child. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I love about Mrs. Walker is that it epitomizes uh, those things that are unique about black women. And when you see the Mrs. Walker piece, she's, um, she looks very proper, very confident, but she's cutting her eye. And black women are the only folks I know that can tell a whole story cuss you out, dismiss you <laughs> just with their eyes. And Della captured that in Mrs. Walker. And I just fell in love with it. And I remember uh, at that time, I, I don't remember the price I paid, but I thought it was way more than I could afford. And Della allowed me to purchase it on um, layaway. And I think I'd actually started doing the layaway beforehand. And um, I um, came back to Mrs. Hewitt and paid off the rest of old Della and got Mrs. Walker. So that's where my, uh, my career started. And I'm always looking. Um, the last piece I bought was um, a young artist that's also in this show last year. And then um, like June, I've had to slow down a bit because I live in a small house mm -hmm. and um, I don't have the wall space. So one of the things I've been doing is I started buying artists to do small pieces. So pieces that are four by sixes, uh, slightly larger than uh, postcards that I could, so I got small art for small spaces. So I'm starting to look at collecting now different pieces that can fill in and so I suspect I'll end up with spaces not unlike uh, Mrs. Hewitt, where mm -hmm. all of my walls are um, collected with uh, uh, beautiful art. I was going to say about, um, was Ken Brown the last artist that you purchased? Yes. And uh, Ken just uh, finished a mural um, for Milwaukee County 
um, that's uh, downtown, by the way. Right, and there he's uh, on the cover of a small uh, arts magazine called Kia, I think. Really? Um, mm -hmm. And um, he's gotten several commissions, so he's been very active. In the well, as I said, I uh, again, uh, my approach is I fall in love with the art. Um, and uh, for Ken's work, it was really very hard because he has a certain style that is is uniquely his. Um, and but it was a but and he had a lot of pieces in that the style is very similar. And so at first they all looked alike, but I kept going back. <laughs> <laughs> I kept going back, and then I started seeing the differences. And um, so. As I said, that piece that was uh, calling my name said, come on back and get me, and I did. It's funny. it's funny, I'm laughing because you said they all look alike. And basically, when an artist does a particular body of work, all the pieces look alike. Yeah. You know? And that's part of what makes a mature style. You know. Well, you say that. The first artist I know to do to do that was Picasso. I happened to piece to see the the secret collection that Harvard College mm -hmm. has of Picasso work of his blue period. This is when he wasn't known by anyone. He was poor. And it's his blue period because the only paint he had was blue. Right. So everything is blue. <laughs> right. So so again, so when I saw, I remember seeing, I saw that Picasso work early and it made me think about Ken's work and it just brought me back to say, was well, something here. So is, is Ken doing the same thing Picasso where he, he has a, is a certain style he's and discipline he has. So the, the subject still fits within the style he has. And lo and behold, while it's a style, each piece is in fact unique. You just gotta see it. Right, and it's good that you get involved, I think, with the artists, as all of you are doing. I think that's when you can. Um, the piece that I put in the exhibition, I'll just talk about mine since there's some time. Um, I started collecting maybe in 1970, I don't know exactly when, but um, I had an instructor that came to UWM as a visiting professor and he gave us a test. He was teaching about abstraction because I really saw abstraction as maybe they're just scribbling. So I didn't know anything about, about it, so I took that class. And what he taught us was everybody has a mark. You know, they, they make marks a certain way, like this piece by Monir that's up. Monir draws like that, nobody else draws like that. And you could see all the little pieces and the little lines and the little symbols in the back uh, yep. that, have, that have to do with his um, beliefs or his philosophy, his, his background and connection to Africa. So that's because it's Monir's style. Yeah, so, and Monir's piece is probably right behind Mrs. Walker, uh, the one I have, uh, greatest love when I um, I don't remember where I first saw it but it was two years before I bought it oh okay and I fell in love with it immediately <laughs> I couldn't get it so it took me two <laughs> years um and it's and um and I'll say this guys I told uh, uh Blaine I think I said this to you I really consider it an honor to be able to have my pieces in but the day that Cedarburg came and took my pieces, and that next morning when I got up, I, I, I felt like my woman had left me. I mean, I saw these blank spaces on my wall. I mean, I really had a withdrawal. And in fact, I actually had to go get pieces and put them up because it seemed to help just a little bit. And yeah. the Manila piece, it's the first piece I see when I get up in the morning. It's the last piece I see when I go to bed. And so it just, I, I never thought about it. It wasn't until my pieces were in the museum that I realized the connection that I had as the collector mm -hmm. uh, and the love that I had for them. And uh, like Mrs. Hewitt, I look at them as my, 
my next set of children. And as I said, it was just really hard. And when I went to the museum to see them, it actually helped a little bit to see them, <laughs> even though they weren't, even though they weren't in my home. Thank you for saying that, Wayman. I had the same issue. I have hung um, quilts and other paintings and masks and stuff. I didn't dig it out stuff because they are a part of my day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I know, I know what to wear sometimes because I can look at those artworks and decide what kind of day I'm going to have. So thank you for saying that because we are very, I'm very connected to mine and I'm going to get to see the bird before they bring them home, but I'm going a week before they bring them home. So I don't have to miss. <laughs> 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 and and Wayman, I, I, I agree, you know, after, after talking with you the, the several times about that, you know, I walk out, I look over the fireplace and, you know, it's not there. And yeah. I'm, maybe the yeah. show, I should have just run it for two months rather than three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's just a minute with a real sense of loss. I, yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm there all the time. I, I, I can get in there and I'm like, maybe I should just, <laughs> just take it home and bring it back before the morning opens. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I think that's funny because I don't quite feel like that. And it's because I started so long ago and I have so many pieces, but um, I'm, I'm like always trying to figure out how to get them out into the world and show other people of, about some of the artists. Like I remember I heard they were having an exhibition of collectors at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And I said, I'm just a regular person. The people that they uh were like Bud Sealing or somebody, you know, it's people that here have huge pieces from nationally blue, known, nationally known blue chip artists. So I said, I'm calling them anyway. <laughs> and I called and said, I have some artwork by some interesting people. Um, can someone come and look? And so they did end up taking uh, Reverend Josephus Farmer and Reverend Simon Sparrow. Josephus Farmer was here until the, near the end of his life, he went to live with his, a relative in another city. But the art museum had a big collection of his work. Uh, a lot of people bought his work and then a lot of it was donated. And Simon Sparrow, if you look him up, he's um, in a gallery in Chicago. And that particular gallery, the way they got his work is they paid his, uh, rent in Madison for his place. So when he died, you know, they had access to everything. So I was just fortunate that I got a piece from him. And I did have the, you know, stories that we could tell about things. That story is so long. And maybe we could talk about it someday, about how I got a piece from Simon Sparrow. And I know when I, when I got it, he said it was $18,000. And I said, Oh, well, I can't. I mean, I only brought $100 with me. <laughs> and he, he said, well, take it and you can take more. But before that, he had been very reluctant. He would never let me buy anything. Um, I would come to interview him and he would say, um, I said, Where, where's the pile of $50 drawings that you sell on the square? in Madison at the university. And he said, oh, it's over there. And so I said, pile of $50 pieces. And I looked through it and when I pulled something out, he said, well, that one is 200. And I said, oh, I thought this was a $50 pack or <laughs> stack. And he said, he didn't say anything. He never said anything after that. So I said, well, show me the $50 um, stash of pieces you have that you sell all the time in union to people. And he did. So he showed it to me. He said, oh, it's over there. And I went over there and looked through it. And I finally found a piece. And he, when I pulled it out, he said, that was 300. <laughs> I said, all I have is $50. <laughs> so then I left and I would come back and do that and talk to him. And one day I took my son with me because I had an opening reception there. And uh, 
I just said, let's stop Simon Sparrow and see if he can, if I can get something today. And he let me in and he said, after he talked to my son, Fun Day Bridges, he said, you can have whatever you want in here. And I kind of just said that one and pointed to something and he said, yeah, you can have it. And I said, okay, let me get it out of here real fast because I did not know what happened to him and why it, it cost 18,000, how long is it gonna take me to pay for this, you know? So I took it down, but then he told me, well, you could take anything else you want. And I said, oh, that's okay. I, in my mind, I was saying, I can, I can only work on paying this $18,000 piece off. <laughs> so I thought, I thought that uh, was a unique experience that I had in collecting. Um, you, you know, almost, one, on. one of the things that I was, as we were talking, I was thinking about, I remember getting one of your pieces, Evelyn, um, mm -hmm. at a silent auction years ago. Okay. Um, you had donated to, I think it was my church or someone, but um, I bid on it and I was surprised that I got it. Um, that St. Mark's? Yeah, yeah, right. So that was a long time ago. I still have it. It's one of the ones that I rotate out. And over the years, just seeing your development and how more people know and appreciate your art, I was really pleased. A lady who knows me very well gave me a piece of your art when I got married three, wow. three years ago. Oh, right. I remember that. Very, yeah. And it was very similar. She's also a collector in this section. Yeah. Nancy. Nancy Samuel. Nancy and I were roommates in grad school. Oh, okay. We know each other, know each other's taste very well. It's so funny. She came to visit me the other day and found out that we had the same shoes on. That we had <laughs> and that's what you call synergy. I know. <laughs> and I've known Nancy for over 50 years. Wow. <laughs> so, but yeah, one of my first pieces was one of yours, Evelyn, from a silent auction. Great. Yeah. Oh. Fifteen minutes left. Uh, um, uh, all right. Use a wrap-up question. And I'll see if I have a wrap-up question. I did say if there were any uh, notable experiences that you had in collecting, and I, I remember that Yuna had one for sure. Do you remember you were dancing or something? <laughs> I don't know if you ended up collecting from that person that you went out dancing with. Because remember, <laughs> that was what I wrote about. You're in, wrong for that, Evelyn. You're wrong for that. <laughs> it's in the book. Okay. You haven't seen the okay. book. Who wants to tell Patrick's story? I told her this. Did, did you use Patrick's piece? You have it in the. Remember Patrick Turner? No, but it's okay. You could talk about the story of. You. Okay. But, so, Patrick was not only an uh, amazing artist that I'm sure you've seen his work, he was also a really good friend and totally insane. Patrick tricked me to go out with him one night. And I'm all, this was, so you guys all know Calvin Greer, who was also a good friend. So Calvin, me, and Patrick. And Calvin now, has pieces in the exhibition. Okay, you have, oh, yeah, one with with Patrick. Patrick. right. Yeah. You got Calvin, the woodworker, Patrick, Patrick, musician, textile, acrylic, and me, crazy, and don't know no better. So <laughs> out we go, down on Brady Street. Patrick yeah. danced all night long. Patrick did limbo, he danced on tables, he did tap dance, he danced with every man and woman in the place, and then came back to my house and passed out for two days. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and it was, I'm like, I should have like told, told you not to take Patrick out. And nobody said, don't go out with Patrick because he's crazy. And we had the best time ever, probably the best date I ever had was with Patrick. But the funny part about it is he was just sweet, kind, and loving, and a great artist. And the reason that I told Evelyn that story was <laughs> soon, I, I, I never would buy a, I was like you, Winston, I didn't really like Patrick's work. And I couldn't find anything that was me. And Patrick kept saying, come and get whatever you want. Come and get whatever you want. And I was like, I don't know if I want any of this stuff, Patrick, that you did. And finally, we found a piece. And I'm so glad that we did because it was months 
before he died that I was able to acquire that piece. And so it's very special to me because timing is everything. And I look at that piece of Patrick's and I love it. And um, I think of him often, him and Sylvester Sims, both work I have that isn't in the show. Mm -hmm. um, but those, those um, artists are forever in my heart. So that's my story about acquiring a piece because it took that night out to get a piece that we actually could agree on that I wanted. So thanks Ellen for making me talk about Patrick. And we do have a Patrick Turner piece that Sandy lent. And uh, Mary at first was going to lend one, but she couldn't at, at the last minute. So I called Sandy and said, you by any chance have a Patrick Turner in your house. I would love to have him represented in this exhibition. Um, do you want to say something? I, I want to say one thing, since we're on the subject of Patrick, please artists preserve your work correctly because Patrick's pieces are rare and they're hard to find now because they didn't have a preservation strategy in place when he passed. Mm. And it's been increasingly difficult and heart-wrenching to know that a plethora of work might be lost because it just wasn't planned for. So your estate planning and how the, what the Hewitts did, we, we need to be, again, economically smart about even the artwork because I think it's- yeah, and I was so pleased to see a piece of Willie Christians. Do any of you know him or remember him? Well, I know him, of course. Yeah. I, we were at the same time. I was just starting out and I saw William Christian walk into my building, uh -huh. the apartment that I lived in, and he was tall and so straight and erect. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. he had a suit on and he had an e uh, easel. Uh -huh. Like a black man with a suit on has an easel. I had never seen anything like that in my life. And I really didn't know when I first started, I didn't know that many artists, um, black artists. Uh -huh. So he was the first one I think that I remember. So I kind of lived around him a lot. Yeah. And he was a character. So I knew him very well. But his work is in several collections. Mm -hmm. so did, did you get a piece, June? No, I didn't. I knew, you know, knew him, knew of him. When the Inner City Arts Council used to have the art uh, every year down at the uh, Performing Arts Center mm -hmm. um, outside, it was. You, I, I don't know if you all remember that, but that, that's where a lot of the artists. I remember seeing Edgar Jeter's art there, right? And Ken Shiju. Um, and Bill Christensen, and that was at least 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. But I, the point um, Una made about preserving the art and having it available that people really appreciate it and know it, know it and know our artists, this exhibit that Cedarburg has done, and hats off to you, Blaine, for making this happen, because I think the people who go through and see it are really amazed at what they see. Um, and we just have, hopefully we can have more opportunities like that. But I, I appreciate that. And I, I, I wanna just say a couple of quick things here uh, to, to your point, you know, June and, and Una is that uh, it was my hope to have some programming around this to mm -hmm. show people how to, you know, position artwork in their uh, estate planning uh, you know, upkeep up and, and, and maintaining artwork and putting collections together. I, I still hope to do that, but right now it's uh, COVID is kind of putting a <laughs> right. kibosh on some of that. Um, because well, everybody do it, do it on Zoom, do it on yeah. Zoom. I, I think I think we're we're, we're going to try to do that. Uh, so I've, I've been one of the, we we work with a company called Bonhams. Uh, it's an auction house. Uh, they have an office in Chicago and with a lot of a lot of my clients, we, we work with Bonhams uh, mm -hmm. for state sales and things like that. So they're very knowledgeable, not just on a local, but even a national or international scale for, for, for artworks. Um, but it was my hope with, with this to uh, kind of change the perception um, that, you know, people look at 
uh, the society at whole looks at uh, African Americans in the art world as artists uh, more so than collectors of art. So my hope with the show, the idea was to help change that perception um, and to, to, to show people that, you know, we as African Americans also collect and appreciate art mm -hmm. uh, too. Um, and so I, I want to thank all of you for you know, lending us your, your, your prized possessions. It, you know, trust me, it, it, it means a lot. Um, and, uh, um, in, in and for Evelyn, just a magnificent job of curating the show. Uh, so ha hats off to you for picking out the pieces. And I know, you know, a couple of, couple of times we, we went out there to, uh, a few, you know, a few houses, it, you know, it was touch and go with some of the pieces. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and, and Mary, you know, Mary Shimani just doing a fantastic job at arranging the show, uh, you know, working behind the scenes, making sure the artwork is picked up, you know, delivered, displayed, uh, and everything else. And, and, and obviously Allison, who's running the show, and, and, and Samantha, our executive director. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to everybody for helping me uh, see this vision uh, through, you know, through to, to what it is right now. And, and I really think it's a great show uh, and, and, and perhaps one of the finest we've done at the museum. So I, I hope in the meantime, you know, for the museum side, I hope I've given a lot of people a reason to come to the museum that normally wouldn't have a reason to come. So uh, please come and enjoy. Um, stay for the beer garden afterwards. Uh, <laughs> and again, you, you everybody you have my sincere thanks on, on helping me you know bring this dream to fruition so i just want to I'm, a, I'm encouraging people to go up on thursdays when they have music in the beer garden and food trucks that's kind of a good substitute for jazz in the park which a lot of us used to go to on mm -hmm. thursdays but we right. can't anymore. so that's yeah. a great venue and i've encouraged several people to go and i plan to go again myself that after Thursday. work it's every Thursday, I think, like from 5.30 to 7.30, and the museum uh, is open late on Thursdays. Yeah, 5.30 to 8.30. Okay. Uh, so last Thursday, we had a steel drum band in there playing, so it was, it was pretty good. <laughs> and I think you have barbecue food trucks. I know two oh, of them have been there. Yeah, we, we, we did. a barbecue yeah. truck? Um, so uh, smoked at 2.25. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they've got some serious barbecue. They sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from South Carolina, where I'm from, so I really appreciate his style of cooking, which is different, but it's mm -hmm. very good. Well, hey, thanks everyone one. for participating today. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that the show is on through September 27th. Oh. Our museum hours are Wednesday, through Sunday, 12 noon to 4 p.m. And as June was saying, um, the museum is also open on Thursday evenings from 5.30 till 7 uh, during the times that we have the beer gardens. There is also a Friday evening um, beer garden this year as well from 5.30 till 8.30. So I want to thank you all for participating oh, and it's been such an amazing show we haven't sure. had the challenge of getting artwork from 21 different households before so <laughs> this was really special in that regard so okay mary can i insert something sure uh who's that yuna <laughs> you know that is. Say hi. because she's one of the artists right in, the in our exhibition <laughs> oh, that's right. Introduce yourself, Ife. Hi, my name is Ife Olatunji, and I'm Yuna's daughter and uh, Ade Olatunji, the filmmaker. And I'm a filmmaker and a visual and performing artist and a, a visual anthropologist by education. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Evelyn bought you. another one of Ife's pieces, too. I just thought about from someplace, where was it, Haiti? No, it's from Brazil, and it's called The Shrine. And oh, yes, it's, about, it's in my collection. Yeah, yeah. It's about uh, uh, Brazilians' culture 
um, has a tendency to build shrines to unknown slaves. And oh. so it's a shrine dedicated to our unknown ancestors who survived Middle Passage. Wow. Wow, I love it. Now I know more about it. <laughs> so thanks. I'm glad you poked her head in. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to close the meeting pretty soon. Right. It was great to have you. you all today. Thank you for coming. You did greatly.